Okay, uh, welcome everybody to uh, Ben's Book Club, which is our monthly gathering, um, looking at themes to do with Benjamin Franklin, the 18th century and American history. Uh, today, we are joined by Christopher Petley, who wrote the book White Fury, A Jamaican Slaveholder and the Age of Revolution. Uh, Christopher Petley is a professor in history at the University of Southampton. He is a member and former chair of the UK Society of Caribbean Studies and a member of the Association of Caribbean Historians. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so we always like to start these sessions by kind of asking you what, what led you to write this book, White Fury? Well, I'd, I'd been interested in the history of the Caribbean for some time. I'd, I'd been studying it um, on and off really from when I was an undergraduate. So it, it came from, uh, from previous interests. But one of the things that was really important for me is that we'd not got much of an understanding of slaveholders in the, in, in the British Caribbean. So when you think about slavery in the British context, um, most people actually tend to think about the abolition of the institution. And the, the, the name that perhaps most readily springs to their mind is that of William Wilberforce. Um, He's a household name in, in the UK, um, rightly so, you know, he's an important figure and the abolition movement is a significant historical moment. But uh, one of the things that was neglected, I think, both in the academic literature, but also in the more general conversation about slavery at the time when I started to get interested in, uh, in, in, these, in these histories was, was slaveholders. And so my first book was about that. It was, it was called Slaveholders in Jamaica. And uh, um, that came out in 2009. And then after finishing that, looking for another project, one of the slaveholders who stood out for me doing that work as being really interesting, um, also um, interesting because that he was so forthright in his views and so controversial, was this guy, Simon Taylor. So the book White Fury is all about Simon Taylor. And one of the things that drew me to, to Taylor in particular is that unlike many other slaveholders of his generation, he left behind um, lots of letters. So lots of people were writing letters, but tailors have survived. They, they, they're, in a, they're in archives in, in Cambridge and in London, and there are lots of them. And I was, to be honest, I was amazed that nobody had, had, had taken those letters and produced a book about Taylor before, because there's so much there, there's so much material in those letters uh, about his day-to-day -day life, about uh, sugar planting and agriculture, uh, about his politics and his opinions. And uh, many of these opinions, particularly towards the second part of his life, are extremely angry opinions. And that's one of the, the ways in which the, the book got its title. Well, uh, Simon Taylor and Benjamin Franklin have, have in common is that there is such a wealth of you know, letters <laughs> that are available. Um, so you can kind of see the workings of his mind, but I, I kind of, so obviously the book, a lot of it centers around those letters, but um, what kind of other kind of primary sources did you have access to to kind of corroborate what was being said about, um, mm. you know, being a slaveholder in the Caribbean? Yeah, so the, the main source for me with these, with these letters, and um, I mean, one thing that um, if it's okay, I'll say about the letters uh, before I talk a bit about some of the other sources. Uh, when I first got funding for this, I, I'd seen some of these letters and I knew that his handwriting was really, really hard to read. And uh, I got some, um, some money back in 2005 to, to do a little pilot project on the Taylor letters. And I was actually really anxious, terrified, that I would have to send this money back because the letters would prove to be illegible, that I wouldn't be able to read Simon Taylor's handwriting. And I, I remember just this, this feeling of relief washing over me when I started to read the letters and I realized uh, I can crack this code. It's not the easiest handwriting in the world, but I can, I can start to, and then I picked up pace and I was able to read the stuff fairly easily. And I ended up with hundreds of thousands of transcribed words from, from these letters. So, you know, one of those things for a historian that's always really important is, is, is that interaction with the source material and, and being able to, 
to read it and learning those skills of reading it as part and parcel of the craft and the trade. Um, and uh, yeah, there was an anxious moment for me when I first started working on Taylor that I, I quickly, thankfully, was able to overcome. And a lot of the material from the book is derived from the letters. Um, the, the letters, of course, give you Taylor's perspective. And as a historian, you have to be able to read the letters and recognize that Taylor is telling you his story in the letters. Um, and actually, to be honest, he's not telling you his story. He's telling whoever that letter is addressed to his story. And so actually, you get a slightly different Simon Taylor, depending on which letter you read, because he presented himself differently to different readers. And that's that's one of the interesting things about, about any letter writer, and, and particularly about Taylor. He had, he had um, particular reasons for saying things in particular ways to, to different readers. Um, so you have to approach that source material with a proper critical historian's mind. And as you say, Caitlin, you also have to be able to Put it together with with other other sources in order to make good sense of of Taylor uh, and his world and, and and thankfully we've got some other good sources on on him so uh, if you if you read Taylor's letters um, Taylor is this fantastic hard-working man who um, sacrifices his time and his life to making his family wealthy and happy and he's a proud British patriot who does everything he does for the good, not only of his family, but of, of, of the nation. Um, so you get this from Taylor, that particular kind of picture. But if you read other accounts of Simon Taylor, for example, Maria Nugent, the governor's wife, went to Jamaica, met Taylor, and, um, and talks very talks about different sides to him. And one of the things that she is quite surprised to find out about Taylor that he talked very little about in his letters is the relationships that he had with enslaved women on his plantations, which led to a number of uh, illegitimate children, uh, many of which it seems Taylor didn't actually recognize, um, didn't, um, didn't treat as his own children. So that's one thing that you get from Nugent, but Nugent's husband also talks about Taylor, um, talks about the, the sort of influence and power that he has and also how how um, opposed he is to the government. And then later missionaries talk about him in the most damning terms as, as somebody who was cruel, was avaricious, who prevented the, the spread um, of, of the gospel in, in Jamaica, which is true, you know, he did, he, he opposed uh, particularly nonconformist missionaries. So you've got a range of perspectives on Taylor if you look around and read the, the sources from the time. Um, and, there are other ways as well that you can you can use the the archive to find out about about Taylor and his world. I've I've talked quite a lot about about that. So Caitlin, I'll I'll pause in a little bit and we can come back to that if we if we want to, um, because I'm I'm keen that it's not just my voice that that people hear. Uh, no, no, it's very interesting. I mean, what I thought was interesting as well about the letters is, in, as you said, as a historian, you need to be aware that each letter has a particular audience that it's intended for, you know, whether it's a personal acquaintance or whether it's kind of more from, you know, from a political perspective. And um, in some ways, it kind of humanizes him because it shows that he, you know, he is, in, he is thinking strategically about what he says to different people. Um, and so, and there's obviously quite a lot of ego involved <laughs> um, that you can tell from his, his writing. Um, but I just wanted to kind of get your take as well on kind of what, um, so obviously one of the big themes is, you know, the American Revolution happens um, and that kind of shakes up that part of, uh, of the colonies. Um, and so what would have, what was the difference in kind of the feeling towards the American Revolution, you know, by those slaveholders that were in Jamaica and specifically Taylor? I mean, I know that's partly where the theory comes from is kind of the, the mm. aftermath of all of that. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, in terms of the, the revolution, Taylor sees it as a disaster. Uh, he, he writes before the, the American Revolution uh, breaks out, before 
the, the shots are fired at Lexington and Concord in, in the most sort of disparaging terms about the American revolutionaries, uh, about the patriots in America. You know, he, he, he suggests that they're not really principled people, that they're, they're, all, all they're really interested in he thinks is is their own self, their own gain, their own sort of selfish ends. And he says that actually, if you if you push them because they're cowards, they'll back down. Now, how wrong could he have been about that? And um, he uh, he he sees them as as people that are tearing the empire apart, and. Uh, and, and the revolution as it unfolds, he, he sees as, as disastrous um, for, um, for, for the British Empire, but also for, for him in, in Jamaica. And um, interestingly, though, in his later years, he comes to a much more sympathetic view of the American revolutionaries. Um, he, he starts to feel himself as though he in, in Jamaica is facing some of the sorts of problems that uh, the founding fathers were facing in the, the, the revolutionary era in, 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 in the 13 colonies, because he sees the, the rise of the abolition movement in the 1780s and the ways in which the British government sympathize with that and then begin to um, move towards dismantling the slave system. He, he sees that as an imposition on his British liberties on his colonial rights and um, starts to use a lot of the same kind of language as the American revolutionaries used that he would never have used before the American Revolution. They're talking, uh, for example, about how the British government has betrayed the white slaveholders of the colonies, how the white slaveholders of the colonies need to stand up for their rights and their liberties, even at one point suggesting that Jamaica um, that white slaveholders in Jamaica should take up arms and consider separating from Britain. Um, he at least floats that idea. So he's somebody who has a very strident view of the American Revolution as it's happening, as something he opposes and that he sees as a, as a disaster, but who later on actually comes to adopt himself a lot of that kind of revolutionary rhetoric that we see from um, the the patriots during the, the the split with Britain, and that's particularly interesting considering that during this entire period he considers himself to be very much British, even though he had spent the majority of his life in Jamaica, um, and was in fact quite yeah. uh, put out by the fact that after the American Revolution he thought that that Jamaica would, the West Indies would continue to have that relationship with England, but really because of their location was, they were kind of put in the same camp as uh, you know, the, the, the other colonials. Um, so uh, it's, it's interesting to see his, well, the change in his thought process and kind of sympathizing with um, the uh, American Revolution, although keeping that identity as British and wanting to integrate in that kind of higher class British society. Yeah, I mean, but of course, you know, the American revolutionaries were British. Uh, Benjamin Franklin was a, 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 a very much a British subject, right, until he becomes something different in the 1770s. So that is, I think this is one of the interesting things about looking at, at Simon Taylor, um, Caitlin, in, in relation to that question, that, that, that he is part of this bigger British world that includes Franklin, Washington, Jefferson, um, as British subjects, right up until the 1770s, until that final break, and he's got a lot that's in, that he's got a lot in common with those people, you know, huge amounts in common, um, politically and otherwise, with the uh, with the elites of uh, of North America, and, and no one back at that time would have thought to have really imagined someone like Simon Taylor or other big British planters in in the Caribbean, you know, people like Edward Long, for example, as as being distinctive from uh, big South Carolina rice planters or or successful 
um, Virginia planters as well. All of these people have got a hell of a lot in common as slaveholders um, and as people who in different ways are expressing the, their um, talking about their colonial rights, you know, their, their rights as Englishmen transplanted to the colonies. Now, in, in the case of the revolution, those develop into a revolutionary ideology and things go in a different direction in the Caribbean. You see that, that, that breaking away during the 1770s, um, which Taylor laments, you know, he sees that as a, 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 as a very um, unfortunate moment in the history of the, the British Empire. Um, but the, the group I think that I would identify Taylor with most is a, a group that sometimes gets overlooked in conversations about the American Revolution, the Loyalists. And there's been some good work on Loyalists recently um, by Maya Jasanoff and, and others, but it, perhaps it's not so much Benjamin Franklin, but Franklin's son that, uh, that Taylor would most identify with politically as somebody who's uh, very much an American British subject and um, uh, and it's into that category that I think that he, he falls in the 1770s and 1780s as a colonial loyalist with, with, with a huge amount in common you know with with the uh, about one in five colonists in in the 13 colonies who who choose to remain loyal to Britain. Well and um, of course Benjamin Franklin's son um, you get a huge falling out with with Benjamin Franklin um, because of this, because of the differing political views. So I'm sure that within other families, that was the same thing at that time. Yeah. Um, and I think in some ways, you know, Simon Taylor ended up having his kind of dream, obviously after his death, but, you know, that his family continued to, to be these kind of loyalist British subjects and, um, you know, uh, continued his wealth and, um, you know, had a higher place in society, which I know you say kind of in the conclusion to your book. Um, so, you know, in some ways he, he got what he wanted in, in the end, you know, obviously after his death, but he, he probably didn't see it that way because by the time he passed away, um, there had been such a change in terms of, you know, how his profession was, was seen and, and kind of his livelihood. Um, so I, I just kind of wonder if you think that he would have thought that his life was... Um, a success by the end of it or not? It's a really interesting question, Caitlin. Um, so a few things to say about that. I mean, you, you're right, you know, he remains British in his identity right up to the end, but by the end of the 1780s, I think he's he's a disgruntled British loyalist. He's, he's disappointed in Britain. He thinks that Britain's gone off the rails and in the wrong direction. And the, the Britain to which he's loyal really is the Britain that he grew up in with, you know, as a, as a subject of the empire in the Caribbean um, during the, the first half of his life, right? Uh, uh, for between 17... Uh, 39 when he's born up until the American Revolution uh, he remembers very fondly that particular empire basically the empire before um, abolition before the rise of the abolition movement principally that's what he's concerned about although he thinks that there are other ways in which the empire transforms um, to the detriment of, of slaveholders like him in the 1780s. So he's a nostalgist, right? He's looking back through rose tint specks at better times in the past um, and, and is disgruntled with, with the present and with the way that things change in the, in the final ends of uh, final years of his life. So he dies as a, as a curmudgeon. Um, and, I, and I think it's probably important to underline that the reason for this, of course, is slavery. The reason for this is that Taylor's fortune is built on slaveholding. These um, plantations that he owns in Jamaica, which are incredibly lucrative. And we know that by the time that he died, more than 2000 enslaved men, women and children were living on those properties. He's a huge slaveholder in terms of the, the numbers of enslaved people who, who lived on, on his properties. And one of the things that I was really keen to do with this project was to talk, of course, not just about Taylor, but to, to find ways through the book that it was possible to talk about the enslaved people, 
who who Taylor owned, um, who worked, who spent their lives on uh, on his properties, and and who in many cases had quite intimate connections with him. Although Taylor was reluctant to talk about those in his letters, you know, one of the features of this source material to go back, Caitlin, to something you were talking about before, you know, how he writes and what he writes about and to who. He very rarely talks about enslaved people. So one of my challenges in this project was to find those moments in the letters where he did do that, um, to find moments in that material and using other material that would help me to get some kind of an insight into the lives of those people um, who lived their lives as slaves on, on Taylor's properties. Um, and one way to do that is that lists of those people's names still um, exist. You know, one of the, the documents that, ta that, that, that emerges from the Taylor archive is uh, an inventory, a list of property essentially, uh, that of all of the uh, personal items that, that Taylor owned at the, at the point of his death. And disturbingly, in this context, in Jamaica in 1813, that kind of list includes the names of enslaved people. And, and I was able to use that document to uh, to, to write, I think it's in the second chapter, about the lives of enslaved people on, on Taylor's properties. Now, the reason that I talk about that and sort of use the opportunity to go and, and say things about slavery and, and enslaved people is that that's really essential to um, the question that you asked, you know, understanding Taylor's outlook, uh, and particularly his outlook at the end of his life. You know, he dies incredibly wealthy as a result of sugar and slavery but he also dies feeling very frustrated and angry politically because of the rise of an abolition movement that a few years before his death succeeds in ending the slave trade to Jamaica. Uh, not slavery itself, that's abolished after Taylor died in the 1830s, but the slave trade, that, um, that system that allows for the arrival of new enslaved workers to be bought in, in Jamaica by people like Taylor from Africa uh, is abolished by the British in 1807. And, and Taylor sees that as a, as, a, as a disaster. You know, he writes about it as, uh, as madness, as folly. And so, you know, that gives you some illustration of his particular outlook. And he's writing those things actually at a time when many slaveholders had come round to the view that whilst they didn't want slavery to be abolished, they were happy for the trade in slaves to be abolished, or would at least accept that. Taylor, though, wasn't. You know, he was very um, trenchant in his, uh, his pro-slavery uh, politics to the point that he wouldn't even accept the, the ending of the slave trade. Uh, so I hope that in some way sort of answers the, the question that you asked, Caitlin. Yeah, and actually that, it makes me think of um, something else that you brought up in your book, which um, is, you know, he writes a lot about being a hard worker, um, mm. that he works very hard on his plantation when, you know, reading between the lines, um, obviously he's a slaveholder. So most of his, uh, well, the work, you know, in the actual fields would not have been done by himself personally, mm -hmm. um, would have been done by the enslaved people who, who he owned. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I was wondering how difficult was it to kind of read between the lines, so to speak, for, from his writing in terms of, of that sort of kind of rhetoric. Yeah, he, he, he was a workaholic. And, and this is something that's often misunderstood about slaveholders. In, in a way, you know, our, our vision of slaveholders comes from the abolitionists. And, and they wanted to represent their political enemies uh, at the slaveholders and uh, in a negative light. And they also wanted to represent slavery in, in, an, in a negative light as well in, in, in all contexts. And so the sort of vision, the sort of idea that gets passed down about slaveholders is that they are um, not only greedy, but lazy. But the opposite's true in terms of the, the work ethic. You know, successful slaveholders had to work really hard at being brutal and exploitative masters. Um, it, it, it's, it, th those two things, we know this, right? They can go together. You can, you can work hard 
and still not be a particularly nice person. You can work hard and still exploit your laborers. And this was certainly the case with Taylor. I mean, he, he put in the hours. Um, and you're talking about the work though, in his case, um, as you allude to Caitlin in your question, that's not um, physical labor. He didn't do that. White people did not do physical labor by and large in Jamaica, certainly not a wealthy white slaveholder like Taylor. He's talking about um, time spent in the, in the office. Uh, time spent writing letters, time spent going through accounts um, and managing his affairs. Uh, and uh, he talks though about being in the fields that he could he could ride around a, a field of sugarcane and tell you how many uh, barrels it would produce and, and what the profits of that would be. You know, that he'd got an, uh, an, uh, through doing the work, an eye for the business. So yeah, he's an incredibly hardworking person. Um, uh, the, the work that he was doing, of course, we, we, we know the character of it, but uh, yeah, certainly somebody who, who, um, who devoted his time to, to, to profit making from, from, the, from this industry. And considering he, he worked so hard and made, well, worked so hard and made a name for himself as um, a slaveholder, and he was obviously very successful with his um, plantation, um, but I thought it was very interesting the, at the beginning when you speak about trying seeing his family tomb and it kind of being destroyed. Um, well, not much of it remains and kind of that, interestingly how he, and again, it goes back to this idea of him, you know, wanting his family to kind of live on, um, so to speak in, in greater British society and how, how it, he, the, I mean, there isn't much evidence left now, except for except for the letters, um, there isn't much uh, evidence left of what was left behind. And so, um, when you were doing the research, I mean, was it was it quite? I don't know what the right word is. Was it strange to kind of see see kind of the differences in between what kind of was set up in his letters versus kind of the reality of how he was remembered um, to to this day? Yeah, there's um. There's a contrast between, and this is an interesting thing to do, as I think this is part of what a historian has to do as well, is to think about how things looked to people at the time. And Taylor imagined a British empire continuing into the 19th century and beyond, thriving, in which people like him would be at the center. He, he imagines in the first part of his life when he's setting up his business in Jamaica that it's going to last for generations and that, uh, that he's setting the foundations for um, a family legacy that will last at the centre of this empire, a plantation business that will cement his, his family's fortune. But also he sees himself as part of what he considers will remain the central business of the British Empire. Um, the British Empire, of course, in the 18th century is focused on the Caribbean, on sugar and on slavery. And so this is part of the trauma for Taylor of the second part of his life when the abolition movement rises up. Um, and also towards the very end of his life, he can see that the, the, the British Caribbean colonies are perhaps in the future not going to be as centrally important to the British Empire as they had been for, for his generation and the generation before. So that's quite interesting, you know, seeing the, 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 the horizon line, if you like, of the future from the point of view of people writing back at the end of the 18th century, including Taylor, and then thinking about that in relation to what we know actually took place, which was a successful abolition movement, first of all, ending the slave trade and then slavery itself. And in the 19th century, the economic decline of the sugar colonies of the British West Indies, um, to the point that the, the, the Taylor plantations, although they continue to, to, to be productive after Taylor's death, um, certainly by now in the uh, 21st century, um, in the most part, there's little trace of them left. And in you know, a Taylor's family fortune, although he passes it on, much of that got squandered by his, his son-in-law um, quite soon after, after his death. So in, in those ways, yeah, the, the way that he envisaged the future 
um, the way that he envisaged and, and hoped that the future would pan out for his family, um, but also for his particular enterprise and, uh, and, and how he saw the future of the empire is very different to, to, to what actually happened. Uh, yeah, I think that the, the, the imagery specifically with the tomb was quite um, indicative of that, of that kind of uh, the, mm. yeah, the, well, his rose colored glasses versus the reality of how things were. Um, mm. And uh, I think that we're, especially now, we're, we're coming into a time where people want to speak more about kind of the, the lives of enslaved people and kind of what, what remains of, of evidence that we have um, during this time. So um, I guess, is there, is there any other kind of uh, research that you think should be done specifically about kind of slaveholders and, and the people who, and the, and the enslaved people who worked for them? Um, is there anything we can do to kind of bring in more of those stories out there? I think it's, it's always interesting to, to study slavery from the perspective both of slaveholders and enslaved people and um, I mean one thing of course I mean I hope it's sort of apparent from the, the conversation that Caitlin and I have been having um, so far I, I'm keen of course not to it, tell Taylor's story as he would want it to be told himself as one of you know, success um, as a slaveholder and of, of being um, uh, victimized as a slaveholder by these terrible abolitionists, uh, but rather uh, what's your job as a historian? Your job is to try to understand the past and to try to understand an institution like slavery means you need to understand the perpetrators of that institution. You need to understand the people who, who ran it and understand them means, understanding them means trying to really get into the, into the, the workings of their minds and and that I think is really important to do so understanding the perspectives of slaveholders understanding the motivations of slaveholders is something you've just got to do if you want to understand an institution like slavery otherwise what you've got is a caricature of of the institution um, but that doesn't work I don't think um, uh, and it's not that helpful. And I so the job of historians is, is making sense of, uh, uh, of this in detail. And so, you, and so to do that, you've got to understand someone like Taylor. Now, one of the things that I say at the end of the book about Taylor is that nobody wants to identify with, with him. And that I think is just absolutely true. You know, nobody wants to uh, imagine that Taylor is is theirs, you know, part of their their ancestry, their lineage, their identity, um, and I think for all sorts of really good reasons, you know, it, absolutely that the, the the guy is repellent to us in the twenty first century for all sorts of reasons. But one thing that I do think is really important for us to make sense of when looking at slaveholders is remember that these people are human beings and remember that the things that they're doing are motivated by very human set of aspirations and desires that desire for wealth for status for prestige and for acceptance the the, the, the plantations of the caribbean were a way into acceptance by the english elite that's one of the ways that taylor saw it um, and those things, I think, are, are, are basic human um, desires and, uh, and understanding that slaveholders were acting upon those when they formed a worldview that saw enslaved people not as human beings, but as a means to an end, a means to an end for them to achieve those particular goals. Now, that's something you've got to understand. And hard as it might be, I think for anybody, um, there are those kinds of elements, right, of human nature that are, that are part and parcel of, of, of us. Um, so um, I think you'd be fairly naive to imagine that it would be impossible for you in that situation to act um, entirely differently to, to someone like Taylor. 
Um, so in those ways, I think it's important to to understand him, you know, as, as, like as, as a sort of a cautionary tale, you know, th this is where the flaws of human nature can take you if you let them. So understanding someone like Taylor, I think, is important for understanding the institution of slavery, but they also can help you, I think, to understand a little bit about what it means to be um, a human being and, and, and offer us a, a cautionary tale about you know, how, uh, how, it's, how easily human beings can be led astray to do appalling things, you know, to, to, to commit acts that we can now quite easily, from our perspective, see as atrocities, but that at, at the time were acceptable or written off as collateral damage because slaveholders were able to get themselves into that kind of mindset where they knew what their goals were and they, un and they were unable to see enslaved Africans as anything other than, than units of labor. Um, so that's, I think, part of why we need to understand slaveholders. But I also think there are plenty of reasons that we need to understand enslaved people as, as well. I think often uh, we, there's lots of work that's been done and that continues to be done on, on slavery and on enslaved people, but exciting work that's beginning to be done on the politics of enslaved people and the complexity of those. The, the idea that all enslaved people um, thought and acted alike is in really exciting ways by a range of historians uh, in the Caribbean, in the United States, in this country and beyond um, being explored at the moment. And, and one of the things that I would like to do next is to, is to do some work on that. And, and, and a point of focus for that might well be the Baptist War, the big slave rebellion that takes place in Jamaica in 1831. Um, that, that helps to spark the debate that uh, leads to the ending of the institution, that leads to the Emancipation Bill. But that's a really complicated um, moment in, in the history of slavery, that rebellion. And I don't think it's fully been understood by historians so far. Um, some of the, the really complex ways in which enslaved people in Jamaica developed a politics of their own that helped to spark that particular event. And so I, is that is that your next project that you're working on now? Is that specifically or? I, I think so. I was, I, was uh, I had my notebook out this morning and I was making sketches in there, writing notes down about all of the different possible projects that I could work on. And, and one of the frustrations of the pandemic has been that, that, that I've had to put those on pause, all of them. Um, because other things have taken priority uh, over the past uh, year or so. And so uh, th there's a number of things I want to work on, but that, that particular event, that Jamaican slave uprising, I think is at the top of the list. Well, hopefully, you know, the archives will reopen soon and in the coming months, you know, travel will be able to open up again. So, um, and I know there's a frustration for many historians that of course, you know, um, the pandemic is obviously more important, <laughs> um, but it's, uh, it's, I think it's gonna be an exciting time for researchers to get back out there soon. Um, yeah. So we have time for some questions and I see that there's a few in the Q&A already. Um, so the first one we have is, I would be curious to know your perspective on how Britain behaved towards the American loyalists. Did they repatriate them after the war was over? Yes, I mean, there's, so the, there are, I've forgotten the name of the, of, of the, um, the commission that sent, that set up. There's a really good book about the loyalists by Maya Jasanoff. It's a fantastic book. It's incredibly readable. Um, it's quite big, but um, it's, it reads almost like a novel and, and Jasanoff is an excellent historian as well. It's not just, um, the substance to it. Uh, um, and, and she talks about the different directions that these American loyalists go off in uh, after the, the revolution. And many of them do get compensation and some of them are resettled, including to the Bahamas. And some in fact do end up in Jamaica. So the, um, the person who buys Simon Taylor's main home in Jamaica, a place called Prospect Penn, is 
Alexander Aikman, who was a, a loyalist who left the 13 colonies, went to Jamaica, uh, was a printer and printed the main government newspaper and all of the proceedings of the, the House of Assembly. And he ends up very wealthy, a slaveholder in Jamaica, um, received quite considerable compensation for his slaves and moved into uh, Taylor's old, old house. So they go off in different directions and um, th there are many different types of loyalist. So some of them, like Aikman, wealthy, end up in places like the Bahamas or Jamaica. Some of them end up going to, to Britain itself. Um, but there are also, there's a, 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 an important group of black loyalists, including some of George Washington's own slaves. And there's a, two books about them. One is by Simon Sharma, and you'll probably have, have heard of Sharma and know that he is an excellent writer. Um, that's called Rough Crossings. Um, lots of these loyalists end up going first to Nova Scotia and then later on to the, um, the West African colony of Sierra Leone. There's also a really good book by a historian called Cassandra Pybus called Epic Journeys of Freedom, which uh, talks about these journeys taken by the black loyalists in the years after the revolution. Interesting. Um, so the next question we have is, did Britain feel any loyalty or responsibility towards the enslaved people held by British loyalists in the colonies? That's an interesting question and I, I can't remember what sort of policies there are for slaveholding loyalists who, who choose to migrate from the 13 colonies, the new United States after the revolution. I think those people remain enslaved and are taken by um, by loyalists, but I, I can't remember. Um, certainly in terms of the slaves that are owned by the biggest group of loyalists actually, which are the, the West Indian slaveholders, uh, they, they remain enslaved until the 1830s. Um, so this is, I think this is something that's, that's worth remembering about loyalism and the American Revolution, that it actually looks very different from the perspective of, of Caribbean history, because there are, um, there are 26 colonies in America at the point of the American Revolution, and only half of them secede, only half of them break away um, and, and declare their independence on uh, in, in July of 1776. The, the others remain loyal, the, the, the colonies of the British Caribbean remain loyal. And there's a wonderful book by a historian called Andrew Jackson O'Shaughnessy called An Empire Divided, which looks at the British Caribbean during the American Revolution. So most loyalists are people living, uh, are, are American colonists, British American colonists living in those uh, Caribbean colonies, and most of them slaveholders. And in fact, being slaveholders is one of the reasons that they remain loyal. Uh, one of the reasons for them not joining the, um, the 13 colonies, amongst many, is that they are worried that if they were to uh, rise up in rebellion, that their slaves would also rise up in rebellion and, uh, and take the opportunity to, uh, to take over the islands. Um, which is what happens in French Saint-Domingue, you know, when those white colonists there begin to assert very stridently their rights in the 1790s, it helps to spark a huge slave uprising, which ends up um, helping to create the independent state of Haiti in 1804. So the age of revolution from the Caribbean, I think, um, is interesting and, and the American Revolution from the perspective of the Caribbean is interesting and, and, it, and it amplifies the importance of these stories of, of loyalty, of the, the loyalty of slaveholders in the Caribbean to the empire. Um, and it's, I think, yeah, an important part of, of making sense of the American Revolution. The, the Battle of, of Yorktown, for example, probably would have gone differently 
Um, exactly how differently, of course, you know, go figure, we don't quite know, but it probably would have gone differently had the British not been so concerned with defending the Caribbean from the French. Um, the, the, one of the reasons that the French Navy is able to give its support to Washington's land forces uh, at, at Yorktown is that the British Navy is elsewhere and the British Navy is, is down south in the Caribbean, protecting its, its vital interests in, in that region. So all sorts of really important ways in which I think a focus on slaveholding loyalists and on the Caribbean can help us to, to get a better understanding of the American Revolution. Great, so we have uh, another question. Um, you mentioned that slaveholders were hardworking and that contrasts to the popular image of slaveholders as lazy and greedy. As you conducted your research, what was the moment when your perception of slaveholders changed from what you believed going in? Yeah, it's an, uh, an interesting question. I think that um, I, I, I knew that I think about, about slaveholders before writing the book about Taylor, but one of the things that stands out as particularly um, important about Taylor is, is his uh, is his work ethic and his and his desire to talk about it you know he 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 contrasts himself with his brother who is living a life of leisure back in Europe off off the um, the proceeds that Taylor's creating in the in the Caribbean through this plantation empire his brother is traveling on the grand tour through all of these European sites. And he, he writes to him and says, oh, you, you have all of the sweets of life and I um, have all the bitterness of, of hard work here in the Caribbean. And so you start to see how important that is to, to Taylor's self image. But it's, it, it's really clear that running a plantation is an incredibly risky business and something that, that requires heavy investment, not just monetary investment, but also um, of, of time and, and, and effort. So these enterprises can, these enterprises require uh, a huge capital outlay. You know, to buy a plantation means raking together more money than pretty much anybody has got. And so you have to borrow. And so people like Taylor are heavily leveraged, that they're mortgaged up to the hilt. And, and they know that um, a hurricane, for example, can wipe out their plantation and mean that it's impossible for them to repay on that mortgage. And they, and they, that they stand the chance, therefore, of, of losing everything that they've invested. So, I mean, to coin a phrase that... Um, that Joyce Chaplin uses, the historian Joyce Chaplin uses as the title of one of her books. It's an anxious pursuit for slaveholders. Um, and from reading things like that, I, I understood this, right? The, 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 the precarity of, of running a plantation, um, whether it's in the United States in, in, in the lower South, which is the region that Chaplin writes about or in, or in the Caribbean. But certainly, you know, looking at the Taylor letters, that brings it into, into sharp relief that um, the, the abolitionist image in, in a way is just is, is too simplistic. You know, it, it, and, and it's misleading because it, it, it takes you away from those things that I was talking about before, which is the, the complexity of, of slavery and, and the importance of making sense of it um, on, on human terms, you know, the slaveholders as, as three-dimensional human beings, they, they perpetrated really atrocious things, um, but um, they, they, they don't conform to the, the caricature of, of, of the bad guys. You know, one of the things that's particularly terrifying about slavery is that it was perpetrated by ordinary men and women. And so making sense of that is part, I think, of of the work of um, you know, understanding the institution, but also what, what are the implications of that beyond just looking at that history for the sake of it? Um, so we actually have a question from one of our volunteers, <laughs> David Walter. So I'm just 
name dropping. <laughs> um, but he says, um, would, your, would you view Taylor um, as an early form of business magnet or does he have any similarities in economic terms to someone such as Bill Gates or Steve Jobs where they have run, where they can run factories at a cost and buy up whole swaths of land? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to, yeah, it's hard to draw those kinds of direct comparisons, I think. I mean, but the, the, one of the ways to, one of the ways to characterize that the planter class of the middle of the 18th century is as the sort of equivalent, I suppose, in that era of, say, the oil barons of the of the first half of the of the twentieth century, or, or you know, big industrialists or railway magnates in uh, in the nineteenth century, so they they are the 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 wealthy group of their era, and they're they're this they're this group in the middle of the eighteenth century, you know, when they're sort of at their nadir, that that, that seem to represent. The, the the cutting edge, if you like, of the British imperial economy. This is where fortunes are being made, uh, and some of them, in in just a generation or two, uh, are building themselves up into really wealthy and influential people um, from from relative, um, relatively modest starts. So so Taylor's father is a guy called Patrick Taylor who migrates to Jamaica from Scotland. And um, the, the evidence suggests that he did not arrive in Jamaica as somebody who was uh, super wealthy, but he certainly was by the time that he died in Kingston in the middle of the 18th century. And he passes that wealth on to Taylor, who then takes it a step further and becomes, when he dies, Taylor is one of the wealthiest men in the, in the whole world, one of, one of a small handful of super rich in the British empire. So, the, you know, this group, is um, is is that kind of group, and and you get figures emerging from it, like William Beckford, who's the Lord Mayor of London in the middle of the 18th century, um, and, and and another reason that they don't secede from the empire at the time of the American Revolution, um, it's not just that they're afraid of slave uprisings, although that is perhaps one important factor. It's also that they feel that they are successful and influential in the British Empire. It's one of the things that does distinguish someone like Beckford or Taylor from someone like perhaps Benjamin Franklin, um, that they feel that their voice is heard. They feel that they've got lobbying power. And um, that begins to erode uh, after the revolution with the rise of the abolition movement and other things. But certainly at the beginning of the 1770s, they feel that they've got the ear of government. So in that respect, they are perhaps similar to other successful industrial lobby groups or you know, powerful people that have got those, um, th those channels through which to influence power. Um, they're, they're certainly that kind of group though, uh, in the middle of the, of the 18th century. Okay, well, um, thank you so much, Krister, for your time. Um, and for having this discussion with me and for answering these questions. Um, uh, so, um, yes, so this was Ben's book club. Uh, thank you very much for everybody who's joined us as well. Um, we will have a recording of this available. So if you'd like to watch it again, um, and of course, please do send any of your questions to us if you, if you have any further follow-up questions. Um, and uh, yes, the next Ben's book club we have is next month um, in May, and it's about uh, Fanny Burney. Um, so please do join us. And uh, thank you again, Krista. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Bye, everybody. <laughs>